Hello, and welcome to Sunday School with Pastor Josh. One evening after a long day, Johnny went to bed, and his head was hurting, his body ached, he was tired. He fell asleep and hoped to get a good night's sleep, which he did, and he got up the next morning. And he rolled out of bed, and he fell flat on his face. When he looked down, his entire right foot was gone, as though somebody had taken it in the middle of the night. Now that sounds like the beginning of a horror story, or a horror novel of some kind, but in reality, it's something that occurs every single Sunday. You see, Paul describes the church as a body, a body of believers. And when people decide to skip church or go to another church out of frustration or uh, are taken out of commission because of something that the devil has done or uh, they become disgruntled and they just don't want to come to church or they just flat out don't feel like coming, uh, we are missing parts of the body. You see, God knit together a local church, and he knit together all the parts to be in cohesion with one another, unified with one another, working towards the same thing. And one of Paul's favorite analogies, of course, is that the church is the body of Christ, which means that when one of the people uh, or multiple people are missing from the church, we are literally missing parts of the body of Christ. Now, we may think of church as a, um, an or a uh, organization or a business or a, a, a social gathering of people, but the analogy of the church as a body really drives home the point that the body is a living organism, that the church is a living organism, that it lives and it breathes and it is continuing to grow and grow and grow. And it thus depends on every single person, every single part of the body, to be involved each and every week. Otherwise, the body, of course, is then unhealthy. The more we see the church as a body, the more that we can recognize that Christ, as the head, is directing each one of us to do something specific and to do it within the context of the body as we are being a, uh, as we are being equipped to carry out what he has called us to do by being connected to that body that is then of course connected to the head who is Christ as paul tells us we are the workmanship of god we are created in christ to do good works which he has prepared beforehand and we are going to take a look at that uh, here later on. But the reality is, the fact is that we should walk in the good works that he uh, has called us to. We should. But many times we don't want to walk in those good works. Many times we want to go our own way or do our own thing. We may have this uh, compulsion or this um, prompting by the Holy Spirit to be a part of our grow ministry or to be called into ministry or be a part of the choir or to be a part of the deacon, um, the deacon committee or deacon board, whatever it might be. And we may resist that, but that may be the calling that God has placed in our lives that he has called us to because he has already appointed works for us to do. And of course, we have the ability to resist those works, but we should walk in them for that was why we were saved. You see, God has especially equipped us for the work through the church. And so hopefully what we're going to understand is that the church uh, as a unified body is vitally important to our growth. You see, rogue cells in a body cause cancer. Rogue cells in a body demolish healthy organisms. And the same is true about uh, the Christian life. You see, if we are not connected to the body and we are going off and doing our own thing apart from the body, the body itself suffers. Worse, it can come back and cause um, a, a, a difficult season of ministry for that church as they try to navigate getting through their uh, season of ministry without a part of the body that is essential. So today we're really going to focus on the church as one body with Christ as the head, our role in the church, and how we are all being built together into the dwelling place of God through the Spirit. So here we are. If you have your Bible with you, we're starting our new, um, our new section of the quarterly this month. 
uh, in Ephesians. So we're beginning our study of Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 23. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he has subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So one of the first things that really jumps out to me about this passage is that there is a reality that God looked upon Jesus uh, as his son, and he saw the obedient nature by which he lived his life in perfect submission to the Father, and he, by his authority and his power, raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the right, at the right hand of God. And I just want us to think about that for a moment because it's often said that the safest place to be is in the will of God. I don't know what that means exactly. I'm not sure what the context of that quote is, uh, but nothing could really be further from the truth. Now, it's true that uh, the safest place to be um, safe from the wrath of God is in the will of God. But the safest place to be oftentimes is not inside the will of God because God doesn't promise us uh, saving from uh, pain or affliction or uh, persecution or financial if, uh, difficulties or loss. He doesn't say that these things won't come. And therefore, when we say that the, uh, that the will of God is the safest place we can be, I'm not 100% sure what that means. And it can be misleading because I want you to think for a moment about the life of Jesus. Uh, the safest place that Jesus could be was in the will of God. Wait a minute, because Jesus was uh, persecuted while he was alive. He was um, ridiculed. He was challenged all the time. Uh, people made fun of him. And then you have the fact that his own creation uh, beat him and mocked him and nailed him to a cross and somehow that's the safest place to be. But the reality is that while we say that, the, the fullness of being in God's will, of course, is the safest place to be. Because the payoff for being obedient to God is much greater than anything that this world could possibly offer us by being a part of the world and doing the will of the world. While enduring suffering, you see, Jesus took... Uh, in his mind, the reality that anything this world could offer would pale in comparison to what God had already promised. Jesus was willing to suffer and he was willing to die in order to reap the rewards that God had promised. And as God looked upon his son and his matchless obedience and his steadfast uh, uh, commitment to carrying out the will of God, God raised him up and placed him at his right hand above all rulers, all authority, all power and dominion. And all of these things would come under his feet. So I have a question for you. As a believer, what implications does the reality that Christ is seated at the right hand of God and that God raised him by his power, what implications does that reality have for us? The first implication that we can take from this is the reality that Jesus' authority to command and to rule our lives and direct his church is established in the authority and the power of God the Father. Non-submission to Christ in our lives, in our own uh, individual walk, or in our church attendance, or our church life, or our involvement with the church, is ultimately rebellion against God. For us to say that we don't care that Christ intends for us to be a part of his church or that church is not important or that we won't be involved in the activities of the church or to say I don't really want to walk in the works that you've put before me is a direct affront to God's authority and Jesus' authority that he's been given by God the Father to direct the lives of individual Christians and his church. It is God who decides what is right for us 
It is not us who decides what we get to do to try to serve God. As we move further into the text, we see that God has placed everything under Christ's feet, that he has appointed him over all things, everything, especially the church, which is his body. Now, this is an interesting analogy uh, that we actually see very clearly in Paul's conversion. If you remember back to Acts chapter 9, Paul is on his, road, on his way to Damascus. It says that he's breathing out threats against the church, and he has this authority to drag these Christians back to, um, to be judged and to be, uh, some of them tortured and other, uh, others of them killed for their professing the name of Christ. And Paul is on the way to Damascus, and a bright light shines around him, and Jesus appears and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul asks him, who are you, Lord? And the Lord answers, it is Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, he, wasn't, he didn't nail Jesus to the cross. He didn't take an active role in nailing Jesus to the cross like a Roman soldier. No. But Jesus says that Paul is persecuting him. You see, the persecution that Paul was carrying out against the believers, Jesus, Jesus identified as himself. It's as if there's an association with them that Jesus himself was being persecuted through his church. His body was being ravaged, even though his physical body was not being ravaged. His spiritual body, that is the church, was being ravaged. The reality of our walk with Christ is much more than lip service and intellectual knowledge and a relationship with God. It means that we are one with Christ, that there's a reality that we are one body unified with Christ, that we are the body of Christ. Being one with Christ is a spiritual reality that you and I share. And we are called to be unified as a body of believers around that. We are, as believers, a part of the universal church. It's just not Paramount Baptist Church. We are connected to believers all across the world. The body is called out and empowered to carry out the ministries that he has called us out to do. These ministries and the unity in the body of Christ are not optional. You see, what happens is many Christians and many people who proclaim to be Christians will say, I don't really need the church. I can do Christianity on my own. I don't really agree with organized religion. Organized religion. Well, let's think about that for a second because the opposite of organized is disorganized or chaotic. And there's nothing chaotic about God. If each one of us lived our, uh, our Christian life individually, without any association with any other person, there is no way that we could possibly know God as well as we do as being a, together as a body of believers, because iron shock sharpens iron. And because God is unified in the Trinity, we are called to be unified with each other and to grow. We, we were not uh, we were not saved to be individual Christians. We were saved to be in part of a relationship and part of a body that continues to build up and build up and build up, which we'll see here in a little bit, into the dwelling place of God. So we have to understand that as Christians, we cannot be rogue body parts because rogue body parts do one of two things. They become cancer and they destroy whatever body they're in or they go off on their own separated from the head, and they die. So it's foolish for us to think that we can do our Christian life without a connection to the body. So if you're not coming to church, or you're not part of a ministry, or you're not uh, following through um, what God has called you to do because you don't really want to be attached to the church, I want you to imagine with me that you are a hand. You're not just a hand. Your hand that has no fingers and no knuckles and no wrist, no arm. So basically, you're just a palm. How much are you getting done being just a palm? Not much because you can't even move. The reality is that 
In order for the work of God to be carried out fully, the church must be together, growing together with the individual parts all connected and leading to uh, an outpouring of ministries. So that palm needs to be connected to fingers, which needs, of course, also needs to be connected to a wrist, which needs to be connected to the arm, connected to the shoulder, and connected to, ultimately, the head. God has called us to carry out works, and he has called you individually to carry out works inside the body. And so I want you to take a look at what Paul has to say about this in um, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to flip over here to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 10. It says this, For you are saved by grace through faith, that is, not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, not from works that anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. The first thing that we see is that the basis of the church, both universal and local, is salvation. A common salvation in Christ. One can only truly be a part of the body of Christ if they are truly saved by the grace of God. Being a part of a church, of course, then is a privilege, not a right. It's not something that we can walk our way into. It's not some, uh, something that we can work our way into. It's not something that we can justify ourselves into. It's not something we can argue our way into. It is the gift of God. And therefore, it's not a privilege. I mean, it's not a right. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to be a part of God's family. God has called us out by his grace that he provided for us as a gift to be a part of the church and to be a part of something that is so much bigger than ourselves that we can't even possibly comprehend the payoffs that it will have in all of eternity. The fact is that many of us as believers are a part of a church that we attend occasionally. You see, when we're flipping about our church membership, what it really reveals is the fact that we do not truly value the gift of grace that God has given us. So let me ask you this question. What does your church attendance say about how grateful you are for the grace God has given? In order to make you a part of the body, God literally had to send his son to die for your sins so that you could be unified with Christ. He poured out his grace, his unmerited favor upon you and upon me. He made it a gift, a gift for you to be created into the person that he truly called you to be. See, rejecting our part in the church or thinking that we're not important or that we don't need to do uh, other, other works because other people are taking care of it so I can just go on Sundays or Wednesdays or whatever it happens to be, or worse, that we don't even need the church to be close to God because we can do Christianity without the church, reveals that we feel entitled to the grace that God has given us instead of cherishing that precious gift that he has given us through his grace, through his son, Jesus Christ. See, God didn't save you because he had to. God chose to save you. He didn't have to place you his favor on you. He chose to place his favor on you. There is nothing good about you or me that he looked through and he said, man, I got to save that guy because he did X, Y, and Z. Everything that God has done is by his grace. He literally called you and me out to be part of something more powerful and more meaningful than we can possibly imagine. He called us to be unified with his son and to carry out the work of the kingdom that he's doing. Look at what verse 10 says. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for himself, prepared for us to do beforehand. Paul says that we are his workmanship, created 
for good works that he prepared ahead of time. Did you know that God has a plan for your life? Did you know that he has plans to prosper you and not to harm you? Plans to lift you up and give you a purpose and a fulfillment and a relationship and a satisfaction with him in this life that cannot be found anywhere else? You see, when we become one with Christ, the reality is we inherit all of the blessings of God and we have this opportunity to enjoy him now and forever. It's a privilege. It's not a right. And when we come to be one with Christ, the reality is that we give up our rights to command our own lives and to live for ourselves. And we say, we want to live the life that you have for us. And we want to walk in the works that you have pre prepared beforehand. You see, God created us with a purpose, which is to glorify and honor him. And he called us out in order to do those works that he has prepared for us ahead of time. And we have a choice whether or not we walk in them. I want you to think about this for a minute. What has God called you to do that you're not doing? What has God called you to do that you're not doing? I ask you that question uh, because when I first interviewed here and at other churches, uh, the question inevitably comes up, which um, should change questions or something, you know, find new questions to ask. But the question is always, um, it's always the same. Have you ever seriously considered leaving the ministry? And to be honest, as I said, it's a pretty standard question, but my answer is always the same. Yes. I know that's shocking. That's shocking to some of you, I'm sure. You hear one of your pastors say, yes, I have seriously considered leaving the ministry. I, I, I answer it honestly because it's true. It's, it's difficult at times in ministry. As many of you have considered leaving your jobs because uh, things have gotten difficult, there are times where I've gone, I want to leave ministry. But the reality is that pastors struggle with this but ultimately always come to the same conclusion. There is nothing else I could do that would make me happier than serving God, even in the most difficult times of ministry. You see, if God has called you out to do something, there is no greater joy than knowing that you are in it. There is no greater joy than knowing that you are serving the purpose that God has called you to. There is nothing more satisfying than being in the will of God, even when it's extremely difficult. I want you to think about Paul for a moment. Uh, he's going from place to place. He's being persecuted. Uh, many times he was beaten. One time he even died. I believe he died. And then he was brought back to life. We see that he was shipwrecked, that he was hungry, that he had no place to lay his head, that he was stranded. And yet he continued going on because he was truly happy in Christ. And that is the reality of the Christian life, that if we are truly a part of the body of Christ, we are most happy when we are fulfilling the purpose that we have been given by God. Now, it took me a long time to get to the point to recognize that there is a place that God has called me to that he expects me to execute well when there are times where I would much rather be doing something else. There was a time in my ministry where uh, I'm leading worship and I'm going, I would much rather be a pastor, like preaching the word and teaching. I would much rather do this. This looks so much better. And God really convicted me and he said, Josh, I called you where you are. I called you for these works that I've prepared for you beforehand. Walk in them. So there may be things that you feel like, I wish I could do this, but God just won't let me. Be happy that God's allowing you to serve. Be happy he's allowing you to serve where you are. Because I want you to think about if your hand decided one day it wanted to be a foot. It was like, man, I really wish I could be a foot. And, and instead of trying to grasp things and write and all those things, your hand just continually pushed down on the floor every time you tried to walk. It wouldn't do anything else but continue to try to walk. And that's the picture that we get when God has prepared works ahead of time for us to walk in them and we are dissatisfied in the work that he's called us to do. We are like that rogue body part that's like, no, I want to do something else. And we're tripping up the rest of the body. 
So if God has called you to do something, and A, you're not satisfied because you think that you should be called to do something else because you're better at it than somebody else, or because you think that you could do a really good job at it, or you think, um, I'm just not going to do it because I don't get to do what I want. Shame on you. God has called you to do a specific work inside the church and to say, I'm not going to do that because I don't get my way or because um, I, don't, I don't want to do it because I would rather do something else and God won't let me. That says, hey, I'm a rogue body part that's intent on destroying the body instead of helping the body continue to grow. The great reality is that even when we're struggling and even when we are sometimes dissatisfied in what God has called us to do because we're like, we want to be doing something else, we can be sure that God prepared those works beforehand and we can walk confidently in them knowing that we are going to succeed in them. Paul kept going, even in spite of all of the devastation that he faced, he kept going because he knew that he was a part of the body and his role was important to the body. So God tells us that, uh, the Bible tells us that God has set works for us beforehand and that Christ directs us as the head to do those good works and we should walk in them. Now, Paul moves on in chapter 2 to reveal that we are also citizens in the household of God. Look here at Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. It says, So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building, being put together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him... You are also being built together for God's dwelling place in the Spirit. Today, it's easy for us to get distracted by all of the things that are going on in this world. It's easy for us to get distracted by race issues, uh, hostility that exists between uh, socioeconomic groups, or even between our neighbors, or the differences that exist that are, seem to be exacerbated. But as a body of believers, we are fellow citizens. And so we are to live differently than the rest of the world, which means that God called us as members of the household to be built upon the foundation that was laid by the apostles and by whom the, by the cornerstone that is Christ that measures all things. It is Jesus Christ himself who measures all things. And we are building on the foundation that they laid, which means that a house or a building or a temple that is fractured by race or is fra uh, fractured by socioeconomic status or political convictions is a house that is destined to fall and one that is being built outside of the foundation that was laid. Yet we know that the foundation of the household of God is secure on the message of the gospel that was passed down through the generations to us with Christ as the cornerstone and the apostles as the foundation. So thus, unity in the body can only occur when we are building on the foundation as individual pieces that Paul, Peter calls us living stones being placed on this foundation, being placed upon the cornerstone, being built up. We can only be that kind of church building, that kind of living place, that living foundation. If we set aside those things that are intent on destroying us, which include fractures in race, fractures in political uh, views, and individual believers not building their foundation, building, sorry, their building upon the foundation that Christ laid. As believers, we 100% have the responsibility to measure our beliefs, our relationships, and our lives by the cornerstone and ensure that when we look back over to the cornerstone, that we aren't out of line with that, but that we are on point 
on that foundation on every single issue that we may be built into the strongest believers and the strongest church and the strongest body we can possibly be. That means that our uh, measurements of how we're doing and growing in Christ and being a part of the body is not based upon the political views of a commentator or upon what our friends think or upon our feelings. We base it off of the foundation that was laid by the apostles and the cornerstone, which is Christ Jesus. The culmination of the unity of the body comes in God's continuing to build us up together into his dwelling place. While we are individual temples of God, we are all being built together as a dwelling place for the spirit. Church is essential. You need the church. I need the church. I know we're in a COVID world where many of us are not comfortable coming back to church, and that's okay. But the reality is that your spiritual health is dwindling each and every service that you miss. If you're not joining us via live stream or you're not coming to church, and I think the best place for a believer to be is inside the church building with a body of believers worshiping in person. But if you're saying, yeah, but I have the live stream, I can stay and, and watch that. You're not really as connected to the body as you should be. And we are missing parts of the body. You need to be in church. You need to be in church. Now, if you have health issues or you're struggling with that, I understand. I certainly understand. I have asthma myself. So there are uh, precautions that I take. And if you're, but if you're sitting at home and you're saying, this is good enough. This live stream is good enough. Or I can get my Sunday school lesson uh, on YouTube. Christian, it's not good enough. Christ died for you to give you the privilege of being a part of his church. Something that can never be taken away and something you should never take for granted. Next time you think I don't really need church or I'm not really that important or I'm not an important part of the church, I want you to stop and think and say, who does God say I am and what does God say about the church? He says, you are a person set apart for good works that has been joined together to the body of Christ in a local church to carry out works that he has laid beforehand to follow the head who is Christ. And to not try to build your life on your own, but to be built on the foundation of Christ and the foundation of the apostles with the cornerstone being Christ in the unity within the church body. Christian, you need to be here. You need to be serving. You need to be investing in your spiritual growth so that you can be the strongest mouth, shoulders, elbows, hands, arms, legs, toes. You can be that we can be the strongest church and the strongest part of the body that Christ called us to be.